Hello there! This is a walkthrough of the tutorial in MMJ2. MMJ2 is an interactive proof tool for the Metamath language, and my name is David A. Wheeler. First, a few starting notes. Metamath is a computer language and an associated program for archiving, verifying, and studying mathematical proofs. In Metamath, every step of a proof must be justified by an axiom or previous proof. Many tools support the Metamath language. The tool this walkthrough discusses is MMJ2. So this is a walkthrough of the tutorial embedded in MMJ2. Its embedded tutorial is a useful way to learn how to use the tool. Before we begin, it's important to note that some axioms and theorems have hypotheses. To use those axioms and theorems, you have to match those hypotheses. And of course, the theorem you're trying to prove may itself have hypotheses. So this is what MMJ2 looks like. Uh, we're going to start up the tutorial, and the way we're going to start up the tutorial is we're going to open up a proof file. But we're not going to open up a proof file in our current directory. We're going to go back up one to MMJ2 jar, and then go down to a sister level, PA tutorial, and we're going to start at page 101. And now we can start with the main tutorial. So here we are on the first page of the uh, Proof Assistant tutorial. I'm going to intentionally read the text to you. Welcome to the MMJ2 Proof Assistant tutorial. The purpose of this tutorial is to demonstrate and explain the main features of the MMJ2 Proof Assistant in a way that is not very boring. You could say that this is an experiment in writing non-boring documentation and that is interactive. Each page of the tutorial is a proof worksheet file stored in the directory mmj2 jar slash pa tutorial. The file names of the pages indicate the intended viewing order. This page is named page 101.mmp indicating chapter 1 page 1. The next page is named page 102.mmp and so on in numeric order. Proof worksheet files are just ASCII text files named with file type .mmp or .txt. Now notice I'm going to scroll down. You can use Control plus and Control minus to respectively increase and decrease the font size of the main text window. Use menu item File Open Proof File to view the next page, page 102.mmp, and similarly for the pages that follow. By the way, if you made changes to a page, you should answer No to save changes before open. Otherwise, you'd be op updating the tutorial itself. So let's do that. Page, Open Page Proof, page 102 open. So here we are on page 102. Let's continue. The tutorial text is written as a proof worksheet comment statement. This comment statement began on line 2, where the star is, and continues down until the next line that has a non-blank character in column 1. Okay, a blank in column 1, or a blank line, indicates continuation of the previous line. Non-comment proof worksheet statements, in fact, are distinguished by specific tokens beginning in column 1. Header begins with dollar $paren. In fact, comments themselves have an indicator, the asterisk. Distinct variables start with dollar $d. Hypothesis statement start with the letter H. Derivation steps start with pretty much anything else. Footers uh, have dollar open per, close paren, I should say. And a generated proof begins with dollar equal. Okay, um, and so right now you can see what these look like. And it mentions if you type in a control U, you'll see a generated proof. And so that's what that looks like. Okay, just one more introductory page ahead. So please proceed to the next page of the tutorial, page 103.mmp. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to open up page 103. Okay, we are ready to start doing some interesting things, but first, here's a key concept. The MMJ2 Proof Assistant GUI is just a rudimentary text editor that's connected to other programs that process, process proof worksheet or text files. The MMJ2 Proof Assistant GUI program knows nothing about proofs, math, or logic. It's just a basic text editor with extra features. You enter and update proof text, and then use the Unify menu up here to check your work. And that's the proof of the whole thing. The other menus are fun too. 
The MMJ2 Proof Assistant GUI does not even update the input metamath.mm database files. You have to do that manually or with the metamath eimm.exe utility. The good news is that it is very safe. Until, unless you explicitly tell it to save, lo, store, or load using the file or TL menu items, it updates nothing on your system. You can't damage a proof worksheet by experimenting with it unless you do a file save. Also, if you really mess things up, you can use Edit Undo or Control Z. If you're running on Java 8, undo will undo a block of text, while if you're running on Java 9 or later, undo will undo a character at a time. You can use undo repeatedly to keep undoing more until you get back to where you want to be. If you undo too much, you can use Edit Redo, Control Y. So if you've not already done so, play around, try to break things, read or reread the help screens, play with each of the menu items, well, except file save unless you're feeling dangerous today. Try everything, have some fun, and then proceed to the next page of the tutorial, page 201, and be ready to get to work. And we'll just go ahead and get ready to go to work. Uh, I, at this point, I don't think I'm going to keep showing the page loading because I think you've got the idea. Page 201. Okay, time to create a proof. Here's what we want to prove. QED. PH implies that PH implies PH. In Metamath, every assertion is either an axiom, a statement we assume to be true, or a provable assertion, a statement we can prove from axioms and other provable assertions. For our purposes, theorem is a synonym for a provable assertion. The purpose of MMJ2 is to help people create proofs of theorems. In the header statement, line 1, we are naming the theorem with label a proof label. Since the theorem is new, the label name must not occur in the input metamath databases, either as a label or as a symbol. Press Control u and see what happens. Right, let's go up here and see what happens. Oh, look, it filled something in, and ah, there's a proof down there. So here we are, page 202. Let's press Control u to unify the proof worksheet. Let's do it again. Amazing! The MMJ2 proof assistant filled in the missing part of our proof, the ref label, AX1, that justifies the QED step. And then because the proof is valid, it generates the Metamath RPN format proof, ready for copying into the input.mm Metamath database file. You can tell that because the status screen here says RPN format Metamath proof generated. At the end of the proof, there's a dollar equal right here that shows the compressed proof. But what just happened really? The program searched the Metamath database for an existing axiom or theorem that justifies or unifies with the steps formula. And here's what that steps formula was. And it found AX1, the first axiom in set.mm. This is one of the shortest possible proofs, just one step. Our theorem, a proof label, unifies with AX1 because it matches the pattern of AX1. It fits. First, AX1 has no logical hypotheses, and neither does a proof label, so that's a perfect match. Next, AX1's formula is PH implies PS implies PH. And that can be made to match PH implies PH implies PH by substituting PH for every occurrence of PS and PH for every occurrence of PH in AX1. These are perfectly valid substitutions because AX1 has no distinct variable restrictions, $D. If AX1 did have a $D PHPS restriction, then uh, the statement that PH implies PH implies PH would be invalid because we substituted PH for both PH and PS. Thus, a proof labels QED step unifies with AX1. And we can say that AX1 justifies writing pH implies pH implies pH. So the argument's valid if you accept the validity of axiom AX1. Unify may take a number of seconds to run the first time you use it after starting up MMJ2. Don't worry, that's a one-time cost. Unify is generally quick after that. Okay. Now as an experiment, in the location after field in the header, enter WY. Don't erase AX1, just leave that. Then press Control U and watch what happens. Then go to the next tutorial page. W I control U. Mm, look at all that stuff. Well, we'll find out what that means in a moment.
By the way, I'm reading pH as well, pH. But of course, when you see the final generated form, that's really a phi and PS is psi. We're now at page 203. So let's create the same situation again. Press Control U now and see what happens. And look, again. Oops, the request errors screen pops up and error EPA 0349 appears saying invalid ref equals AX1 on derivation proof step. Ref statement sequence number is greater than or equal to the sequence number on theorem or location after statement. You can leave ref blank to allow Unify to figure it out for you. Okay, so erase the AX1 ref on the QED step. Okay, let's get rid of that. Maybe that'll help us, right? while leaving the WI in place, and now we're going to press Control u again. Now you'll just see uh, PA411 Theorem A Proof Label QED step incomplete. We're going to fix that on the next tutorial page, page 204. Alright, so here we are at page 204. Press Control u now and see what happens. This is the setup we suggested in the previous page, page 203. We have no reference and location after equals WI. The message we get is PA411 theorem A proof label step QED step incomplete. Why? Because location after equals WI. Here's the story. The location after WI means that logically speaking the A proof label theorem that we're trying to prove is located just after the WI statement in the input .mm metamath database file. A proof may only refer to symbols and labels that are located prior to it in the Metamath database. This prevents circular reasoning. So this proof is now only allowed to use the contents of the database ranging from the start through statement WI, because that's what we're saying. The WII statement is before the position of AX1 in the database, so with this configuration we cannot use Axiom AX1. If we left location after blank and the theorem named by theorem doesn't already have a position, then the logical position of the theorem would be at the end of the Metamath database. Again, location after is only used for new theorems. Because if the theorem already has a location in the database, then its location is used. Okay, now onward to the next tutorial page, page 301. Here we are at page 301. Take a look at the step colon hype colon ref field at the start of each proof step below. Notice especially how these fields work. Hypothesis step identifiers are prefixed with an H. The H isn't considered part of the step identifier. Notice that you do not have to include the latter two fields. The hype part must always be empty for hypotheses because hypotheses can't have hypotheses. Step identifiers must be unique and they're often numbered but they're not necessarily in numeric order. You can use alphanumerics for step identifiers, but they can't begin with the letter H since that indicates a hypothesis. So notice, for example, QED is not a number. Okay. The final step identifier indicating the conclusion to be proved is always QED. Ref labels in this example start blank. Okay. We don't have any ref labels. Uh, MMJ2's Unify can sometimes fill them in. If there's just one colon in this field, it's too, assumed to be step colon ref. Older versions of MMJ2 assumed it was step colon hype. Blanks aren't permitted within a step colon hype colon ref. This makes things easier for the MMJ2 programmers. Okay, so now press Control U Unify and see what happens to the step hype ref fields. Notice that Unify fills in a lot of information producing full step hype ref fields. Are we ready? Let's go to the top. Push Control U. Look at that. See, now we've got doubled colons with a lot more information. Okay, proceed to the next tutorial page, page 302. I'm going to show loading that just because I can, so I'm going to open up page 302. Alright, let's press Control U now to unify the proof. Notice that the unification process modified the step hype ref fields of the proof steps. Omitted colons were added. Ref labels were generated for these hypothesis steps. Sil clone 1, sil clone 2, sil clone 3. These names are arbitrary, but they must be unique. 
Steps 3, 4, and 5 in QED were unified with the assertions A1i, A2i, and AXMP, respectively. The step hypothesis can also be updated, though in this case there was no change. Okay, forward to the next tutorial page, page 303. Oh, you'll notice that once again we have a, a compressed proof generated here in the bottom. Okay, so here we are on page 303. Press Control U now to unify the proof. And boom, all of a sudden, lots of things have been filled in by MMJ2. There are two important things, actually more than two important things to notice in the proof steps above. Hypothesis step 30 here is redundant. Okay, It serves no purpose except to make the point. MMJ2 and Metamath don't warn the user about unused logical hypotheses and proofs. And you can see this. QED spend depends on 1,000 up here and 4 up here. 4 depends on 3. 3 depends on 200. Oh wait, nobody depends on step 30. Hypothesis steps never have hypotheses of their own. That is, the hypotheses portion okay, right here is always null. Remember, no blanks inside the step hype ref fields. That will generate an error message. Now, as an experiment, erase the A2I. Okay? We've been forcing it to not use all of the statements available in the setMM database. Now we're going to change the QED steps hype to 200 comma 1000. We're going to keep the 1000. Okay, but we're going to add ask it to use 200 instead. So use the 200 step and the 1000 step directly. We're going to get rid of this thing. AXMP. Okay? All right. So now we're saying hey, QED depends on this step and this step and that's it. Let's press control U. Ho. Oh. Look at that. We got another but slightly different proof. All right, forward on to the next tutorial page, page 304. I guess I can load that up, open the proof page. Oh, should I save changes? No. I'm going to open 304. Here we are at page 304. This is the same proof as on the previous page, except the A2I and location after has been erased. The QED steps, step ref AXMP has been erased, and its hype has been changed to 200 comma 1000 as was instructed on the previous page, 303. Press Control U now to unify the proof. You should see the same results at the end of the last page, where step QED is the reference to SIL, syllogism. Notice that because the location after field is blank, SIL clone is logically located at the end of the Metamath database, and therefore the QED step could be unified with Theorem SIL, and therefore steps 3 and 4 are not used in the, to complete the final proof. And the order of the hypes in the QED step was reversed to match the input order. The proof assistant resequences hypes, so you rarely need to worry about the correct order. Nice. MMJ2 does not flag redundant proof steps, but it also doesn't include them in the final output um, Metamath RPN format proof except for required hypes themselves. What this means is that you can use these other redundant steps in the MMJ2 proof assistant as a scratch pad or work area. In other words, you can try new steps in the middle of an existing proof to experiment with new derivations. Now, just an experiment, change the QED steps hype back to 1004. Okay, so uh, let's see here, 1004. Okay. Erase SIL. Okay. Make sure you have a colon after the 1004 or MMJ2 is going to think you have a proof uh, a theorem called 1000 comma 4. Okay. Now press control U. Oh, we don't have SIL anymore. We have XMP. Okay. That's because SIL doesn't unify with the QED step anymore. We're telling it that you have to use 1000 and 4. And SIL won't work on uh, if given 1004, but AXMP will. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, SIL doesn't unify with QED step anymore given hype field 1004. Instead, MMJ2 will use AXMP because AXMP is what matches 1004. This proves that MMJ2 follows orders and is not a mind reader. Okay, forward to the next tutorial page, page 401.mmp. 
So here we are, page 401. In this section, we'll go into some of the more interesting features of the MMJ2 proof assistant, and also talk about proofs in MMJ2 and Metamath. Press Control U now to unify the proof. When you press Control U, the following message, info message appears. Step QED, step incomplete. The reason for the message is that the proof worksheet only has one derivation step, the QED step. The theorem hypothesis doesn't Theorem hypotheses don't count as derivation steps because we don't derive them, they're starting points. In addition, the QED step has a blank hypotheses and blank reference. If a step has no errors, its hypotheses are blank and it's, or has a question mark, and has blank ref field, it's considered merely incomplete. Unification isn't attempted for it. However, a key point to remember, a derivation step is allowed to use an incomplete step and the referring step can be unified. This allows you to create a part of a proof forwards, that is, one claim forwards to some other claim. The MMJ2 proof assistant is specifically designed for flexibility. In fact, this is one of the reasons I like MMJ2. MMJ2 lets you prove backwards from the goal backwards back to known facts, prove forwards from known facts towards the goal, and prove middle out, prove some statements from other statements in the hope that, that this information will eventually be useful. You can even use any combination of approaches while developing a single proof. Nice! Okay, forward to the next tutorial page, page 402. Alright, so here we are at page 402. Press Control U to unify this proof, where we try to use the hypothesis directly. So we've got a QED step, and we've filled in a reference directly to step to reiteration.1. Oops! This error message is displayed. Theorem, reiteration step QED, invalid ref, reiteration dot one on derivation proof step. It doesn't specify a valid statement in the metamath file that was loaded. And the proof text input reader last position, blah, blah, blah. So when you see a proof text input reader statement, okay, this one right down here, okay, that tells you that the error was so severe that processing stopped immediately while initially examining the text. The program didn't even attempt unification. The problem is that the MMJ2 proof assistant requires that the ref label refer to an assertion, not to an hypothesis, okay, not lame like that. This is a limitation of the MMJ2 proof assistant. It was intended to simplify programming. In practice, this isn't a significant limitation. Okay, forward to the next tutorial page, page 403. There are two ways to prove this. The simplest way to be prove this would be to modify step QED so instead of having reiteration 1 over here, you put a 1 to refer back to step 1. And then you press Control u It's going to modify QED by adding a ref to IDI, and it's, that'll actually complete the proof. See, got a metamath proof generated. If you look on the bottom, there's the compressed proof. Okay. If you do this, make sure you undo repeatedly get back to our initial situation. So we're going to look at this in other ways. Okay. The two theorems in set MM that are essentially the same as reiteration, IDI and dummy link. If you use IDI in the ref and then press control U, you'd, that would also pre complete the proof. In fact, let's go do that. IDI, see, look at that, same thing. Okay. All right, now I've, undo, I've pressed undo a bunch of times. This shows that MMJ2 often needs either a hype value after the first colon, or ref value after the second colon, to complete a proof step. As we've already seen, MMJ2 can complete a step if it can unify the step with an existing theorem with no hypotheses. However, most steps in real proofs require something else to be true first. You could also use dummy ref as the ref in step QED. However, that will not lead to a trivial proof. The default MMJ2 configurations avoids using dummy link when filling in proofs because the default MMJ2 run params text config file uses a land like this, okay, where it says proof assistant unify search exclude dummy link. It's unusual to prove something directly from itself, so usually using dummy link or IDI indicates a mistake or a special technical use. But because the statement is trivial, it's a useful place to start us to start in a tutorial. This theorem is interesting for another reason. It has the shortest possible metamath RPM format proof, WPH, in the underlying metamath system. 
the label WPH is the label of a, of the variable hypothesis statement that said mm that refers to the with variable pH. Another interesting fact is that its proof in Metamath requires no axioms. That's right. It's just a built-in feature of the underlying Metamath proof language. Just top, just pop WPH onto the stack and QED. So you might think that studying QED steps ref to WPH would work. Okay, we could try that. WPH. Okay, it turns out that won't work. Try it and see what happens. Okay, we'll explain that in just a second. If we try to use WPH as QED's ref, we'll see this error message. Theorem reiteration, step QED, invalid ref equals WPH is not an assertion. A derivation step ref must refer to an assertion, such as a logic axiom or a theorem. You can leave, leave ref blank to allow Unify to figure it out for you. Proof, text, input, reader, last position. The error message is hopefully clear enough. In MMJ2, a ref must be an axiom or previously proven theorem. We're going to intentionally avoid the already existing proofs of this theorem, that is, IDI and dummy link. And we've shown that we can't use WPH directly in MMJ2. So for tutorial purposes, we're going to instead actually proof this theorem using axioms and theorems directly in spite of the fact that one, that proof's already in the database, and two, it's obvious that if statement A is true, then statement A is true. But anyway, we're going to do this. As an experiment, let's set the, AX, the QED steps ref to AXMP. That means the last proof statement should be QED colon colon AXMP and it is true that pH. Now press Control u see what happens. Alright, page 405. In the last page you press Control u and saw the unification derive feature in action. It should have led you to this. Okay, we're all of a sudden we have multiple steps and some strange symbols and so on. The derive feature is an integral part of MMJ2's unification process. Derive is automatically invoked during unification when one, an assertion ref label is input on a derivation step and fewer hypotheses entries are provided than needed, okay, ignoring any question marks, and or the step's formula is omitted, though you can't omit the QED formula because that's what tells you what you're trying to do. Derive attempts to generate an omitted formula and or the step's hypotheses. Hypothesis steps are generated if the derived hypothesis formulas are not already present in the proof. In some sense, derives in the inverse of the normal unification process of finding a matching assertion ref label for an input formula and its associated hypotheses. Derive instead fills in the other missing pieces given the information available. In this case, the derive function took our formula from the QED step, pH, and unified it with the assertion AXMP in some unknown hypothesis hype. Since we gave Derive no hypotheses and AXMP uses two hypotheses, Derive generated two hypothesis steps for us that match AXMP's hypotheses and filled in those hypotheses using the information it had available. Bang D1, colon, colon, ampersand W1, bang D2, colon, colon, ampersand W1 implies pH. The exclamation parts are requests for additional automation and are added by default to generated hypothesis steps. We'll discuss the exclamation marks later, ignore them for now. Note, we only gave derive one variable, pH, and AXMP uses two variables, so derive substituted a work variable called ampersand W1 for the missing unknown variable. We could modify ampersand w1 and change it to any valued with variable or expression. Work variables are meta-meta variables. You only need to change one instance of a work variable. Once you change one, then the next time you use control u, the other work variable's values will be all substituted to match. More generally, the derived function will produce work variables whenever there is insufficient information. And they'll be written as w, w something, wc something, ws something for the first woof class set, respectively, with numbers increasing as needed. Any hypotheses generated by derive are automatically sent through the unification process themselves unless they contain work variables. Observe that the generated step d1 has a formula that looks suspiciously similar to our hypothesis step 1. 
<laughs> we might have known that at a time. In the next page, we'll see how we can provide such partial information and use it during unification. All right, forward to the next tutorial, page 406, but let's go back and see what we got here. We told it, hey, use AXMP, and it created these new formulas and these new steps, and it filled in at least parts of the formula where it could. All right, page 406. In this scenario, we'll give the derived feature one known hypothesis, step one. So for whatever reason, we've decided not only are we going to use AXMP, but we, we think we should be using uh, step one as one of our uh, hypotheses for this step. Okay, because we found out that AXMP uses two logical hypotheses, and one of them looks very similar to our hypothesis. Press Control U, watch the derived function in action. Whoa, we generated proof. I want to see that again in slow mo. What happened? First of all, Derive took our hypothesis that we specified, step one, and the QED formula, okay, which is this thing here, and it unified them with the specified AXMP, producing the file following variable substitutions, pH for pH and pH for PS. It didn't need to derive the first hypothesis for AXMP because we expressly told it to use hypothesis step one. However, AXMP requires two hypotheses. Derive then use those substitutions to derive the missing hypothesis step, this one right here. Okay, and it used AXMP's major logical hypothesis as a template. And that meant that it created step D1 for me automatically. Okay? Then, to be extra helpful, Derive went ahead and attempted unification of this new der derivation step, D1, success. The new step unifies with the assertion A1i. See, so it immediately put that in there. Oh, wait. Then unification proceeded normally and discovered the proof to be complete. Yay. Okay, so forward on to the next tutorial page, page 407. All right. Okay, page 407. Let's do a replay automatically completing this proof using the derived feature. But first, note that as an experiment, step 555 has been 5555 has been added. This will demonstrate deriving a formula, though in this case the derived formula won't be used. Okay, so we've got this, and then we've snuck in this 5555 and asked for SIL. Okay, now we're going to press Control U. You ready? All righty. Okay, we told a we told we wanted to use AXMP in one. Okay, so it created another step for us, and it used one. It filled that in, and in fact, it managed to complete the proof. But we had another step that asked for SIL, and so it created whatever was needed in order to to use the step we the uh, the the step in the reference we asked for. Notice that MMJ2 figured out that since AXMP used two, requires two hypotheses, but we only supplied one, it had to add the other hypothesis. It then repeatedly replied to unification and managed to complete the proof. The step 5555 wasn't used, but was present, so MMJ2 expanded it as requested. Okay. To tidy up, let's use the menu item, okay, unify, unify and renumber. And we can also use edit reform pr reformat proof. Edit, all right, reformat proof. Okay. The renumber will change the step identifiers into a simple ordered sequence of numbers. Some people find that convenient. Note that doesn't remove currently unused steps. You might want to use them later, okay, which is why it doesn't remove them. So it's done. The derive feature can derive formulas too, except for QED step formulas. That's not allowed since there's no way for MMJ2 to automatically know what you're trying to prove. There's a tremendous amount of documentation about the derive, derive feature in the proof assistant GUI derive feature. Are you still there? I hope so because some tremendously useful information is available on the next page. Page 408. Page 408. Back on page 404, I wrote, as an experiment, set the QED steps ref to AXMP, but how do we know that AXMP would work or that we need a hypothesis for the QED step? Well, to justify pH, a hypothesis is needed because otherwise we would have to have a formula, I'm sorry, a theorem, using no logical hypotheses saying that every WOOF formula is true. That's unlikely. 
So we believe right off the bat that hypothesis is needed for the QED step, right? So here's your reiteration again, but now the question mark okay, in the steps hype field. Now, if we double click on that QED step, we're going to fire up the, QED, the Unify Step Selector Search. That's going to show us the possible justifications for the step and the resulting expressions if we chose it. Note that having the question marks in the, is, in the hypes is important in this case. If you double click on a step without a question mark, like QED colon colon, okay, just blank, straight up, then MMJ2 will reply with only proof steps with no assumptions. If you double click search on a step with a question mark, such as QED question mark as shown above, it will also search for proofs of the expression with possibly additional hypotheses. And after you're done looking at the step selector dialog, either move the dialog off to the side or click the hide dialog button. Then go to the next page of the tutorial. Right, so let's do this. Oh well, look, we have the step selector dialog and there's a lot of different things that we could choose. Okay, IDI and ID8 will do this and so on. All right, we're going to hide the dialog for the moment though. We'll come back. Okay, page 409. Now that we know how to start and hide the Unify Step Selector, let's start again and actually use it. Double click on the QED step to fire up the Unify Step Selector search. When the Step Selector dialog window appears, scroll downwards until you see AXMP, then click on one of the AXMP lines and watch what happens. Wow, suddenly a lot of information was filled in. Let's do that. All right, here we go. We could select IDI, we could select not not RI. And if I selected IDI, here's what would happen. And we're just going to keep going down. Oh, there we go. And so this, we're going to select that one. I can select any of these lines to select it. I'm going to double click it now to say, yes, do that. Page 410. This is what should have appeared on the Proof Assistant GUI after you double-clicked one of the AXMP lines on the Step Selector dialog, as instructed by page 409. See this stuff right here. So what happened? From the Step Selector dialog item you selected, the AXMP assertions label is edited and pasted into the ref field, and then Unify was invoked. The unification process then performed in the usual manner and derived two hypothesis steps for QED, which correspond to the requirements of AXMP. So let's try out the step selector again. For this demonstration, first remove the bang, the exclamation point, in front of step D1. Now normally you would want that exclamation point there because it enables automation that's normally convenient. However, for tutorial purposes, right now we want to see the proof steps worked out slowly so we can understand them. Now we're going to double click on step 2. Okay, since the hypes field is blank, the step selector will only show steps that don't require any hypotheses. We could add a question mark there to allow all statements to be shown. That would match. Then, on the step selector dialog window, double click the line for assertion ID. It's going to be near the top. Okay, so remember, we're going to double click step D2. We're looking for ID. We ready? Oh, there is ID. ID says, and this. And here's ID. If we choose that, this is what that's going to become. All right, so I'm going to double click that. Okay, and I selected ID, and indeed, that's what happened. Let's go on to the next page, the tutorial, page 411. Page 411. This is what should have appeared on the Proof Assistant GUI after you double click the ID line on the Step Selector dialog as instructed by page 410. If you didn't see this and instead you saw a three-step completed proof, you probably forget to forgot to remove that exclamation point, bang, in front of the old D1 on the previous page. Normally, MMJ2 could complete this proof all by itself once you used ID. For tutorial purposes, we're temporarily disabling this behavior by removing the bang so we can get a better understanding of what MMJ2 is doing. So let's assume you saw the proof above. Okay. The message that you saw at the bottom should have seen something, uh, should have been something like proof, uh, theorem, uh, reiteration, step D1, step incomplete. This proof's almost complete. The problem is that step QED depends on D1 and D2. Okay, now we've proved D1, D2, I'm sorry, but we haven't justified D1. The hypothesis step 1 is actually the same as D1 though. Okay. 
Now, <clears throat> all we need to do is change the QED step from D1, D2 to 1, D2. Okay, so this D1 isn't proved, but one, the step 1 right up here that's hypothesis, well, that's hypothesis. We can just accept it. We already have it. Okay, now press Control U. Oh, MetaMath proof generated. In fact, there it is at the bottom. Okay. You'll suddenly see a completed proof at the bottom, if you can see the bottom. And the message area will say MetaMath proof generated. That means the proof is complete. That said, there's a shortcut. Sometimes many other steps refer to an unproven step that should be replaced with some other possibly proven step. Let's try this out by first pressing Control Z as matched as often as necessary to get us back to the four-step proof we showed above. Now, instead of manually updating the QED step pipe, just update the ref field of step D1 so it looks like a sharp followed by a step ID. Okay? So we're going to undo things a little bit here. All right, so now we're back to referring to D1 and D2. D2 is proven. D1 isn't, but looks we really didn't want D1. We want to use uh, step one up here, the hypothesis. So sharp one. Okay. Hey, D1, sharp one. Okay. This invokes the local ref feature. Okay. Let's see what happens. Huh. D1 went away, and now suddenly everything is referring to step one there. Okay. <coughs> That invokes the local ref feature. It says that step D1 and every reference to it should instead be replaced by the step identifier or ref given after the sharp, in this case, step 1. If you give MMJ2 a sharp followed by step identifier ref, MMJ2 will even reorder all the references so they're topologically sorted. You can also use a ref of just sharp without any step identifier. In that case, MMJ2 will search for any previous step that matches the expression. It won't reorder things in that case. In short, if you use a reference name beginning with a sharp, you'll replace that step and all references to that step with a different step. If you want more practice, there's a bonus tutorial exercise on local refs at pagelocalref.mmp. Okay, keep going just a little bit further to the next page of the tutorial, page 412. Page 412. In the previous reiteration proof example, we double click the QED step to invoke the step selector dialog to see all possible unifiable assertions for the QED step. That works great for proving backwards from the goal, but what about proving forwards? Wouldn't it be excellent to have a query showing all assertions which can be unified with our hypotheses or any proof step we want to use as hypothesis? It's in there. MMJ2 is that feature. Simply combine work variables with the step selector. You have top down, bottom up, or even a middle out search matrix. So step 100 is all about finding unifying assertions using both the uh, hypotheses. Okay, so moving forward. Whereas the other direction here, step QED, we can find underlying assertions with one or more hypotheses. Okay, using step 200. So we're going backwards here. And you can do things in the middle. So if I click on this one. See the list of my options, okay, and it'll show me what will happen if I choose that one. If I double click on that, it'll show that's show me the results. Same for QED. See, here's my options, and you know, I could use AXMP, but here's what would happen. I could use MP1I, here's what would happen, and so on. Uh, it's a pop quiz. You see if you can finish this proof. I, it's okay if you can't do it yet. And frankly, I think a lot of folks might be a little bit of trouble, so don't worry about it right now. Then proceed to the next page of the tutorial, page 501. Page 501. For tutorial purposes, we've been holding back MMJ2's capabilities. MetaMath requires that every step reference an axiom or theorem, but there's no requirement that a human identify those references. A bang before a step enables MMJ2's more advanced unification features on that step. These features can sometimes automatically fill in many steps. They're opt-in because they can sometimes be too aggressive. In particular, if MMJ2 can't finish the proof on that step, it may leave you with many incomplete steps. Those incomplete steps are sometimes very useful, but in other situations they might not actually help. A bang is added by default on new derived steps, unless you change your run params settings. 
In practice, we recommend using the form bang step colon colon for incomplete steps. If you don't know what that step should reference, leave the part blank. That way, the bang will cause it to try to passively justify the step on every unified, every time you press Control U. If you use bang before a step and leave its types blank, unrelated steps can sometimes get proven while you're working on something else in the proof. So let's see this in action. The expression below asserts that 95 plus 1 is 96. Try Control U. Eh, nothing much happened. Now, add an exclamation point in front of QED. Try it again. Ho! Oh. Okay, page 502. If MMJ2 is given no reference and no hypotheses, and it isn't allowed to use its automation capabilities, then unsurprisingly, MMJ2 can't prove the simple claim that 95 plus 1 is 96. But by adding the bang prefix, MMJ2 is allowed to use its automation capabilities, and MMJ2 quickly created the following proof. Okay, 95 plus 1 is 96 because of DEC, SUC, decimal successor, and which depended on these four, which in turn are proved as such. More generally, MMJ2 will generally be able to finish this step if you provide only the ref, because MMJ2 will create the statement, derive the steps, the ref and hypes, because MMJ2 will create the statement, only the statement, and use bang if the hypotheses are available somewhere in the proof document. Okay, <clears throat> This means you can basically delete the entire right-hand side of a proof work worksheet, the statements, and then the final QED step, and will regenerate the proof, i.e. the inferred syntax steps. You can also delete the entire left side of the worksheet, giving only the statements, and it'll find the refs and link everything together. There's another MMJ2 automation that you might not have even noticed, but it's always enabled, even without the bang. If it can, MMJ2 unification respects the order of input hypotheses for a derivation proof step. But if the given order doesn't yield a consistent set of variable substitutions for a ref assertion, then MMJ2 methodically tests other sequences and dynamically rearranges its input hypes if it can find a match. For example, if the input user inputs hype 10, 20, 30, referring to previous steps number 10, 20, and 30, but the reference steps don't unify with the ref's first, second, and third hypotheses, the program seeks an alternative arrangement, like 30, 10, 20. In some cases, there may be multiple satisfactory sequences of hypotheses, so where it matters, you should be specific. You don't have to specify everything. If you don't know what some of them are, you can use question marks in the hype subfield. Thus, using 20, comma, question mark, comma, 10 will cause the system to first try to unify using step 20 for the first hypothesis and step 10 for the third hypothesis, or trying any alternatives. And finally, as we've just noticed, a leading bang enables some additional automation, which can save you time. Sadly, MMJ2's automation facilities are limited. This is true for all interactive theorem provers, not just MMJ2. So in practice, proofs developed with MMJ2 are often developed using a combination of human direction and automation. By the way, note how numbers more than 9 are often written in setnet.mm. Metamath and setmm don't have a built-in construct for numbers. We must prove everything. Uh, so to write numbers more than 9, we can prefix the numbers with one or more semicolons, one for each digit beyond the first one, followed by the digits themselves. Please go on to page 503. All right, page 503. Let's reuse the proof we were doing in tutorial chapter 3, but remove its unnecessary third hypothesis. We'll keep all the statements, but remove all the refs and hypes. Instead, we're going to depend purely on the advanced MMJ2 unification mechanisms by putting a bang in front of all the non-hypothesis steps. So H, H, these are hypotheses, bang, 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 and QED. We still need to know which one is the what we're trying to prove. Now, press Control U. Notice that MMJ2 was able to complete this proof without any additional help. Because MMJ2 had the specific statements it was supposed to use, and the bang allowed it to use more advanced automation to figure out the rest. In this case, MMJ2 was able to examine each non-hypothesis step and find a combination of the given statement, previous proven statements, and a ref that would together create that step's statement. 
MMJ2 is complete in the sense that if all the steps that should appear in the proof are in the worksheet, then we'll find the proof because each bang will find arbitrary one-step proofs derived from previous steps. If there are two or more steps involved, then MMJ2 will often miss it though. Through M though, <clears throat> though MMJ2's automation is able to fill out some multi-step proofs as we've seen. Note that MMJ2 doesn't necessarily need any information other than the bang that allows it to use more advanced unification. It'll even create reasonable step identifiers if they're not provided. Okay, forward to the next tutorial page, page 504. A good way to learn how to create metamath proofs is to study existing smaller proofs, then remove little bits and try to reinsert what's missing. The file get proof, control G command, lets you load any existing proof in as a worksheet. For example, the text below was created by using a file get proof on nngt1ne1, which proves that a positive integer is greater than 1 if and only if it's not equal to 1. You can use file forward get proof, that's control F, and file backward get proof, control B, to quickly move between the proofs before or after the current one. Those are useful looking around and they're also useful for filling in the location after at the top. If you're rederiving something, you will, you know, you may need to fill in the location after with the name of the theorem before the current one. Otherwise, MMJ2's automation might realize that there's an existing theorem and just use it. You can try this all out. Use file get proof, okay? File get proof, okay? And then we can enter in uh, nngt1ne1, okay? And then if I press OK, I'm going to get um, I'm going to get what is you're about to see below. Okay. On my system, I found that NNG1 was before NNGT1E1, so I can now use Control F to get back to it. Okay. Control B, Control F. Okay. Now I can enter NNG1 right after location after to ensure that MMJ2 won't use the real version of NNGT1NE1 when I try to prove my own version. The SetMM database has a list of naming conventions that can help you. In most cases, the name of a theorem is a concatenation of label fragments of the important part of its conclusion. Each label fragment has a meaning, for example, NN for natural numbers, RE for real numbers, 1 for the number 1, GT for greater than, LE for less than, or well, less than or equal to actually, AN for AND, and so on. Uh, most symbols are defined by an assertion named DF name, where name is the label fragment that's used. Note that in set MM, natural numbers mean an integer that's one or larger, not zero or larger, which is a, their competing conventions. Thus, in set MM, NNRE represents the natural numbers are real numbers, and NNG1 represents that natural numbers are greater than or equal to one. Parentheses have to be placed in specific places. When a function that takes two classes and produces a class is applied as part of an infix expression, the expression is always surrounded by parentheses, for example, the use of plus in open paren 2 plus 2 close paren. Similarly, paretic expressions in infix form take two or three woofs and produce a woof that's always surrounded by parentheses, such as ph implies ps. In contrast, a binary relation, which compares two classes and produces a woof, Applied in an infix expression is not surrounded by parentheses. This includes set membership. For example, one exists in RR has no parentheses. For details, see the set MM convention section off the main MetaMath Proof Explorer or set MM homepage. And so here's what happens when you load that in. Okay, here's the proof that a positive integer is greater than one, if and only if it's not equal to one. And you can study that at your convenience. Please go on to page 505. Okay, page 505. MMJ2 is two kinds of search mechanisms for finding assertions. Step search mode, general search mode. You've already seen step search mode. To enter step search mode, you simply double click a derivation proof step on the proof assistant GUI window or position the cursor on a step and then you go select search, step search. Okay, or on the, or the right house, uh, right mouse button uh, pop-up window. In step search mode, there's an implicit requirement that every search result must be unifiable with the selected step. General search mode is the other MMJ2 search mechanism. 
It's not tied to a particular proof step or theorem. General search allows you to search the whole database for assertions, for example, if you're still trying to develop a strategy for your proof. To enter general search mode, select search, general search. Okay. This is going to prevent, present a search form which has many options. Okay. The top row has general search commands. In most cases, you just fill the sections below it and fill, press the search on the top left. Okay. One of the other commands is help. Let's go see this. It's a complicated form though. Okay. See, there's search. That means I actually go search, but I got to fill in some things to find out what it's supposed to search for. Okay. There is a help button right there. There are many ways to control search, but first examine the max time option. Okay. On the middle right. Let's look at that right there. Okay. That one's important. That shows the maximum time in section, seconds that the search will run. Make sure you give it enough time. A key part of the search form is the search data, what you're searching for, and up to four search lines. These lines right here. This line, this line, this line, this line. Okay. These four lines. Okay. A blank for what is ignored. And searching is done line by line, top to bottom, with the and and or evaluated on the right hand side. It's halted as soon as truth or falsity can be determined. In what lets you specify what assertion types and associated metamask statements will be searched in, using the criteria given on the data on the search data line. The default is dollar AP, which searches axioms, the A, and proven theorems, the P. That doesn't include their hypotheses. If you want to include that, you want an E. Part lets you search formulas, comments, labels. Format is the search term format. Let's go show that again. Okay, right here. The, oh, I'm sorry. Here, this is where you select which format of the search. Okay, there are five different search term formats: Metamath, Reg Expression, Character String, Parse Expression, Parse Statements. Each of the four search lines can be in any of those formats. They can all be in the same format if you want. The last two formats, parse expressions, parse statements, are advanced mechanisms that operate on syntactic parse trees. We'll ignore them here. The formats metamath, regular expression, and character string operate on normalized string versions of the underlying metamath objects. Formulas, comments, labels, RPM, proof label lists. The normalized string consists of the non-white space math, label, and lowercase comment statements. And they're separated by single space characters and convert to lowercase. Let's look at each one in reverse order. Care string. That asks for an exact match of at least one occurrence of the search term within the normalized character string version of the metamath object. Comment searches aren't case sensitive. Regular expression. This uses the Java defined version of regular expressions that defined well, in Java. That means dot means any character, star means zero or more of the previous expression, plus means one or more of the previous expression, parentheses group expressions, and backslash dot matches the, pre the period character. Metamath. It's very similar to the reg expression format, except the metamath format used dollar question mark and dollar star wild cards instead of dot question mark and dot star. That signifies one character of anything, um, and zero more characters or tokens of value respectively. When searching values, dollar question mark and dollar star can be abbreviated to just question mark and star. You can use the from chap, from sec, through chap, and through sec to select only specific chapters in their sections is uh, to limit the search. You can also select reset data to reset a search so you can start something new. Okay, so <clears throat> there's the reset data, clear that out. Okay, there's your search and so on. All right. No. So, for example, after setting mix time to some reason viable, say ten. Okay. All righty. Well, by the way, if you hover over, it'll often show you things like that. Okay. Um, after setting max time to some reasonable length, like ten, you go to the first search term and select the format to character string because we're just going to look for literal character strings, and that will ask for what? We'll ask for one. E R R, which is a way of saying one exists in the set of real numbers. Okay, R R is a set of real numbers. 
Then you press search and you'll find some matching assertions. You can close the search results window when you're done. Okay, and here's our search results. Okay. And I'm going to close that up. Please go to page 409. Page 901. This is the end of the main tutorial text for now, but you already know enough to be very dangerous. Visit mmj2, mmj2.html for more information. The documentation directory contains much, much more. Some items you might especially study are the following. The step selector search feature is very powerful. You'll find more documentation about it here. You may also wish to study the theorem loader feature. The theorem loader allows you to store proof in MMT format and dynamically update the MMJ2 logical system. Uh, also, you can have two or more MMJ2 sessions running simultaneously, so you can switch over uh, between a lemma and a main theorem. And feel free to look at the bonus tutorial page, local uh, page local ref MMP, to learn more about local references. In any case, thank you for your time, and wish you the wish you good luck in developing new proofs. So let's wrap this up. Math proofs created with Metamath are extremely rigorous. Metamath verifiers ensure that every step is thoroughly justified. And again, I want to remind you that different tools can verify and or create Metamath proofs. The Metamath language is much more than any one tool. You can, of course, even create your own tool, and that's great. That said, MMJ2 is a useful tool for creating rigorous Metamath proofs. It provides several mechanisms, for example, to simplify creating proofs. So now, hopefully, you have a sense of how to use it.